Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see you at Bowden Baptist Church this morning. We have a lot going on, so if you will listen fast, I will talk fast. You have your worship folder if you look on the back. The big thing is this afternoon. Please do not forget that's our fall festival and trunk or treat. It's obvious that it's going to be windy. So as you decorate your trunks, keep that in mind. Things might fly away. Uh, you can wear your Eskimo costume this year. You know, the one you bought about four or five years ago you could never wear. You get to wear it this year. Uh, but I've had folks like, you know, I don't have anything to do. Just come be here. Walk around, meet the people from our community, uh, eat some candy with us. Just have a good time fellowshipping with the community. This is kind of a gift back to the community, so we encourage you to be a part of that. And then there are a few things coming up. If you haven't uh, already signed up, I think Brother Dan might let you uh, sign up late, but the Senior Adult Picnic will be this Thursday, and that'll be at 11 o'clock. Or we'll be leaving here at 11, headed down to Rockridge, uh, so you can come along with that. Uh, the Richards family would like to invite you to our adoption party. Finally, we got it all scheduled. Well, that'll be Saturday afternoon from 4 to 6. Now, just come by and celebrate with us. We do not want you to bring gifts. We just want you to come celebrate because I know people have invested in our family over the last four years by praying for us and helping us out through the process. And we just want to have a time of celebration. A couple of announcements on behalf of our Honduras mission team. Next Sunday, following worship, we'll have a fellowship meal. It'll be beans and greens. Uh, so plan on staying after our worship service. Uh, we'll take donations for that the way we kind of do it in our family. Whatever we'd spend for lunch going somewhere. Y'all know where we're going for lunch. But where we would go for lunch, we just try to make that as a donation. So maybe you could do that. If you go out and get a Wendy burger for lunch, then bring that 99 cents and give it. Uh, if you go to Los Palomas and spend more than 99 cents, then bring that. Um, but then also, uh, that this Thursday night will be uh, Spirit Night, or all day at Los Palomas will be Spirit Day for the Honduras Mission Team. So a percentage of your purchase on Thursday, uh, all during the day at Los Palomas, will go to our Honduras Mission Team. Uh, and then just a few things farther down the road. Uh, if you're going to bring winter clothing or winter items for the Seven Bridges ministry, we'll need that here next Sunday because the following Saturday they will be going to Atlanta to pass those out. Uh, and then our Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes need to be turned back in on November the 12th. If you will notice on your insert, the shipping price has gone from $7 to $9. So please make note of that as you write your check to um, Samaritan's Purse that that has gone up. Um, and then just mark your calendars Thursday, November the 16th, 7 o'clock will be our community Thanksgiving service. Uh, we have some, uh, some new churches that are coming on board this year. We had a great time last year. Looking forward to a great time this year. Well, this morning, because we have so much going on, Reformation Sunday and Lord's Supper and all the things that are going on, we're going to save our fellowship time to the end. And so we're going to ask now that we turn our hearts and minds to the Lord as we worship Him this morning. I would ask you to stand, though, as we sing together on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. back in the house of the Lord together and uh, just a, a note for tonight um, we will be presenting the gospel um, during our hayride and so they'll be going on and on as a rotation and so as we pray together just pray that as those people come tonight that uh, those that do hear the gospel we will be receptive to it let's pray together now thank you so much once again for the opportunity to be together in the house of the Lord Lord um, we know that wherever we go, that you are with us. You promise us that. Lord, help us to realize that um, as we present the gospel tonight, 
as we come in contact with those in our community, that we would be the light shining in the darkness. Lord, that you would allow us to um, make an impact in lives that we come in contact with. Lord, those that hear the gospel, that they would be receptive. Lord, and even today, as this morning, as we uh, sing praises to you, as we open the word of God, uh, that we would approach it with reverence, that we would approach it ready to receive what you have for us. And Lord, help us to go from this place uh, ready to share it. Lord, um, help us once again to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you go with us. And we are not alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This Tuesday will mark 500 years of the Protestant Reformation. I know a lot of times in Baptist life we don't think about our heritage, where we came from, and how we got to this place. Over 500 years ago, there were a group of Christians who began to have access to the Scripture. Before that time, the church was the curator of the Word of God, and the common person could not read it. But there were those who had access to the Scripture, and as they began to read the Word of God and see what was going on in the church of that day, they realized that there was a problem. That the church was not adhering to the Word of God. And so they began to stand up against the established church of the day. Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. On October 31st, 1517, perhaps the most important day in Protestant history, this was the day when Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk and a professor of theology, posted on the doors of the cathedral at Wittenberg, Germany, his 95 theses, or complaints, against the teaching and practices of the medieval Roman church. With this event, the 16th century Protestant Reformation was formally born. And so today we celebrate Reformation Sunday. The three Protestant main tenets were the reestablishment of the scriptures, clarifying the means of salvation, and the restoration of congregational singing. A mighty fortress was written and composed by Martin Luther. The date of the hymn cannot be fixed with an exact certainty, but it is generally believed to be written for the Diet of Spires in 1529 when the term Protestant was first used. The hymn became, became the great rallying cry of the Reformation, and today, as we celebrate the work of those men and women, the faithfulness of our God, let us sing that great hymn together. Let's stand as we sing.
coming. Boys and girls. Y'all come on down. Did that song blow your hair back? <laughs> you ready for All right, in Justin's sermon today, he's going to be talking about the danger of false teachers, people who try to make you believe the wrong thing. So false teachers try to make us believe something that isn't true. We're going to make this one easy to understand. Two plus two is four. four. Exactly. What's two plus two again? So if I told you that two plus two equals ten, or two plus two equals six, would you believe me? No. Why? Because you know that 2 plus 2 is 4, no matter what, all the time. The answer to 2 plus 2 is always 4. Y'all got that down? So that's kind of what false teachers try to do. They make us believe something that isn't true. Like they might tell us that 2 plus 2 equals 10 or 6. So we've got to know what is true in math and in lots of other things, especially what we believe about God. So you know for a fact, you told me today, that 2 plus 2 equals 4. No matter what, all the time. And nobody can convince you otherwise, right? Right. So always, always remember this fact too. God loves you no matter what, all the time. Never let anyone convince you otherwise. Let's say a quick prayer. God, we thank you that you do love us no matter what, all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. Our offertory hymn is number 530. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Would you stand as we sing together? I'd rather have Jesus than
I was riding down the road with my oldest son, and we came up from a house on Victory Church Road. And he looked at that church, and he said, you know, that's probably the only church in this area that has a letter somewhere that says it was built by an act of God because it was destroyed by lightning. So, you know, they, they've had somebody somewhere that has something like that. As we go into prayer, let's remember acts of God. Please pray with me. Our Father, we'd like to thank you for everything you do for us day to day. We remember the acts of God. We remember, remember your mercy. We remember your blessings. We remember your forgiveness. We look for you for your leadership and guidance. We thank you for everything you've done for us, and please allow us to give back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. teachers and false prophets who want to lead us astray for their own shameful gains. Father, help us to know what the truth is. The easiest way is to identify that counterfeit to know what the truth is. Father, help us today as we look into your word. Help us to be mindful of the remainder of our service, preparing our hearts and minds to receive the elements of the Lord's Supper today. Lord, through all that we say and do, may you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. We pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Then, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to apologize at the outset. We will not be able to cover all the ground that we need to, but if you'll come back in two weeks, when we look at the book of Jude, we'll be able to expound on this, because Jude says about the same thing that Peter does about false teachers. So this morning, we'll just kind of get a little intro to what false teachers look like in the first century. We'll get a little intro of what false teachers look like in the 15th and the 16th century 
And we'll get a little intro into what false teachers look like in the 21st century. This is something that's gone on since the establishment of the church. That when the church was born, when Jesus said that I will give my life for the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, the adversary knew at that point that he had lost the war. But he was going to try to continue to win as many battles as he could. So the struggle that we face in our day, the struggle that was faced in the days of the Reformation, the struggle that was faced in the first century with Peter and the apostles, we are dealing with those realities today, that there are false teachers that are everywhere. So as Peter's writing this second letter, as he's trying to encourage believers, he needs them to understand that there will be false teachers. And I hope that as we go through this brief kind of overview this morning, that you will find in the midst of all this frustration and all this uh, challenge that we face from false teachers and false prophets, there's this one word of hope in the middle of the whole thing where Peter says in verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. We have all the tools necessary to be able to overcome all this false teaching. We have all the tools necessary, all that we've been encouraged through the word of God, all that we need for life and godliness is contained within the pages of the scripture but we have to be diligent to grow in grace and truth. We start talking about this, this understanding of context and what was going on. And how amazing it had to be when the church had been scattered and they were all over the world at this time and they were encountering these different religious beliefs that God inspired Peter to write this text. But then we go up a few more centuries and we start thinking about the reformers. These men and women that are having access to the scripture. Because if you think about contextually, you know, I had some folks that they enjoyed the history lesson last week, so you get a little more history this week. But think about what it had to be for the reformers. Because there had been this period of time where the scripture was not readily available to the common man. We are blessed to have the scripture in our hand. Amen. Because there was a time when the laity of the church and the vast majority of people in the church did not have access to the scripture. And what was even more frustrating is the common practice and the common teaching of the day in the 13th and 14th and 15th and 16th century was you don't need to read the scripture as a common man because it will warp your thinking. And so the church was manipulating the scripture. And you see the corruption, you go study history and the established church of the day was so corrupt. And there are people that were God was was bringing the word to and the printing press was becoming more prevalent. The word of God was being able to be reached by the, the common man. And as they began to read the scripture, they would read things like 2 Peter chapter 2 and go, this cannot be real. What we're seeing in what we call the church today cannot be legitimate. Because what we read in the word of God and what the church is saying, it, it's not matching up. The same frustration even today that some of the, we hear a lot of times, uh, the, the younger generation that's coming up, their frustration with the established church. I get it because you read Matthew chapter 5 where it says that we're supposed to love in a way that if people come after us and they try to take things from us and they force us to do things, that we're supposed to be faithful to serve them and to bless them regardless of how they treat us and even to pray for our enemies. And so if you read that and then you see the established church, even today you might become frustrated like the reformers did in the 15th and 16th century. But man, I can't imagine what it had to be like for Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or any of those reformers during that time period to open up the word of God to 2 Peter chapter 2 and to read these words. But false prophets also rose among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and denying the master who bought them and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation for long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. 
For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the earth of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what was going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, in this parenthetical for as the righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting the righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, Creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves of corruption, slaves of corruption, excuse me. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Can you imagine what it had to be like for these reformers to read this truth and look at the culture in which they function and to see all of this coming to life right in front of them? The established church of the day using sensuality to drive their mission to bring more and more acclaim and more and more wealth to themselves and to those around them to suffer. When Luther figured out that they were that the Catholic Church was causing the people of that day to buy indulgences for their sins and to give money to the church for their sins and then for him to read the scripture and understand that that was so foreign to what the Word of God says. And not him alone, but many others who saw what was going on. And then to come to this text and to see that God had already ordained them to destruction, that God would deal with them what hope they had to have. To then be able to write a song like a mighty fortress. And thank you for seeing that with zeal this morning. I challenge you every time we gather together to meditate on the truth of the words that we're singing, that the choir will sing in just a moment. Allow your heart and mind to be drawn in to your relationship with the Lord, to find that passion, to then go out and make a difference. These men and women, as they saw the truth and as they were taught the truth, were so passionate about getting the truth out to the people that they were willing to stand and give their lives so that the truth would go forward. So just a few things to see this morning as we get again our hearts and minds tuned in to the Lord's table as we think about sharing in communion this morning. As we were playing in the calendar and kind of working toward this, Benny said, you know, we're coming up on Reformation Sunday, and I'll be quite honest with you. 
In all my ministry, we've never talked about it. And my thinking is that if we never talked about the Reformation as, as an intentional part of our worship in our church, I wonder how many other churches had not. They didn't have somebody that saw the importance of what took place now for us almost 500 years ago. Thursday, or Tuesday, I encourage you. Like, I get it. It's Halloween. But think about what that had to be like for Luther to walk up to the established church. He knew what was going to happen. He had hoped that those 95 theses would change the heart and mind of the established church. We know what happens. Right? He was persecuted. He eventually died for his faith. But on that Tuesday, not thinking so much about all Hallow's Eve, to think about the sacrifice that many men and women made so that we could be here today. So this warning comes in the midst of the culture in which Peter wrote, the culture that Luther and the other reformers fought so hard to today where we are in the corruption of the truth of God's Word. Just a few things for us to see. First, the warning of the reality of false teachers. They're going to come. They always have been. They always will be. We as the body of Christ are going to have to be well versed in the scripture. We're going to have to know what the word of God says. And we're going to have to stand on the word. We know that, that philosophies and interpretations and all that kind of stuff ebbs and flows. But the word of God never changes. So we need to know what it says. Again, while we're in Sunday school, while we're in small groups, while we're encouraging ourselves in the word of God. So we'll know what the truth is. The Lord brought it to me as I was praying. But... They teach you that if you want to really identify a counterfeit, you don't study all the counterfeits, right? Because there's dozens upon dozens of counterfeits. But if you know what the real one looks like, you know what a real $20 bill looks like or a real hundred looks like. Never had a real hundred, you may not know what it works like. But anyway, if you're working in a context where you're you you got to be identified, be able to identify counterfeits, as long as you know the real one, then the counterfeits won't fool you. We live in a culture, we live in a world, we live in a day where people don't know the truth. And so when the false teaching comes, whatever it is, uh, talking with a friend a few weeks ago, remember the world was supposed to end last month. Yeah. Right? And there were a lot of people that were like, oh, like serious business, like it's going to end. Well, if I know the truth of God's word, if I've studied what Jesus says about the end times and what he tells us the end times are going to look like, and then we look to the book of the Revelation and we see what John saw about what the end looks like, then we will be able to say, dude, probably not going to end that. Because the scripture tells us no man knows the day or the hour. And God inspired the writer of scripture to even go as far to say, Jesus, as quoted as saying, even the Son of Man does not know when the last day is. The point being, with Him saying that, nobody knows. Our responsibility is what? Be prepared. Keep oil in our lamp. Be ready for the bridegroom to come. So the reality is there will always be false teachers. This is the encouraging part, that even though there are false teachers, God will bring judgment upon those false teachers. And he gives some historical evidence. He talks about Noah and the ark. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He even talks about the angels in heaven who fought against God. God brought judgment against the unjust. Those who continue to live disobediently to God, God will deliver. And again, think about the hope for the reformers as they came to verse number 9 to say, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. God rescued Noah. God rescued Lot and God will rescue us in the 21st century and God was rescuing the, form, the reformers during their time. The hope that that brings us that when we stand against the false doctrine and the false teaching in which we need to be intentional about doing, God will deliver us. Amen. Sometimes that deliverance is into his presence. The reformers got that. They understood that. They understood that if they died for the cause of Christ, it was worth it all. We need to have that mentality in our mindset that no matter what, we'll be intentional about living for God. He identifies them in verses 12 through 19. Like I said, a couple of weeks, come back for Jude. We'll dig into it a little deeper, what they look like. But it's pretty obvious that this idea over and over again is reiterated that they're driven by sensuality. Uh, the way that Jude renders it in the King James is they, they act like brute. 
beasts. We hear it all the time. People are when a, a dog like goes crazy and mauls a kid. They're like, wow, this was the nicest, calmest dog. I don't know why they would do that. I know why they would do that. They're dogs. They have instinct. It is built into an animal to survive. Brother Andy's back there nodding his head. We were serving on mission. And there was a dog. It was pit bull of some variety. And it was mean and it was nasty. And he's like, y'all need to stay away from that dog. And he's a firm believer in do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> he saw that dog just decided to start wagging his tail. He thought, I'll go over there and I'm going to pet this dog. He looks like he's friendly. He's acting like he's friendly. But Andy forgot something. Still a dog. And he went over there and guess what happened? And he got dog bit. <laughs> okay? A dog acts like a dog. I don't care if that mama dog has been living with you for 27 years and it's the sweetest thing. If it feels threatened, guess what it's going to do? It's going to bite you. It's a dog. Okay? And that's what these people are like. They, they yield to their own fleshly desires. And if it were not for the grace of God, every single one of us in this room would go the same path. But God has been merciful. He's put the Holy Spirit in us so that we don't have to go down that path anymore. And when the temptations and the trials come, and you may think, well, they're not that big of a deal. Yes, they are. Satan is the master at lying and covering up truth to get you to fall into your sensual passions that will in the end do what? Destroy you. He said, that's what these guys look like. They're driven by these passions to make them look better. To make them look good. To exalt the man and not God. So what happens? What's the end result of these false teachers is a beautiful thing. God's verdict in verses 20 through 22, they would be judged. And this warning is given. It would better than never have born to have been born to have known the way of righteousness and to turn back from it. In Hebrews chapter 6, there's a great discourse that the writer of Hebrews gives. It's how is it even possible? He says the term he uses is impossible for those that have tasted of the goodness of God, experienced the work of the Holy Spirit, that if they fall away, for them to be brought back to repentance. And I've asked professors, that's one of the things I love about being in seminaries, like, hey, dude, answer this question. And most of them were good professors. They would be like, well, you know, some things you just got to leave in mystery. Like, what does that mean in Hebrews 6? That if they fall away, it's impossible for them to come back to repentance. I, I don't know the depth of it. I just know that the warning's there. I know that Peter gives the warning here that if they've experienced the truth of God's word, that if they go this path, it would be better for them to have not been born than to walk in the truth and then to reject it. And again, uh, Jude will really spell that out. He says in verse 22, the Proverbs true. The dog returns to its own vomit. The sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. We live in a day and age where there's a lot of fake and a lot of false. And the question I want to ask us, are we being true in the midst of a culture that's fake and false? Are we as the body of Christ standing on what the Word of God says? Not what the pastor says, not what the church says, but what the Word of God says. If we want to stand in this culture against false doctrine and false teaching, we've got to know the truth. And so as we turn our hearts and minds towards worship of the Lord's table, we have an opportunity for confession and repentance that maybe what we see in these false teachers, maybe what we see of what was going on in the established church, this pursuit of sensuality, this pursuit of self, is that something that defines you? That what you make your decisions based on is not what would God have you to do or what would the Word of God show you that you should do, but you do what's right. You live in that culture, right? If it feels good, do it. As long as I'm not hurting nobody, it's not really sin. Now, what does the Word of God say? What does the truth of God's Word say? And the scary thing is, we were talking about it briefly in Sunday school, this idea that how we live our lives impacts our children. That we can say a lot of things. Right, Andy? Don't pet the dog. Andy had to show it by his actions. I know. I'm not going to go pet that dog. 
Because he got dog bit. But if we tell our children not to do something and we continue to do it, guess what our children are going to do? Probably going to question everything that we talk about. There's got to be consistency. And Peter, as he's warning the church in the first century, the reformers reminding us, and now to this day, we need to stand for what is true. And if not, if that's not defining who you are this morning, maybe confession and repentance should define you. Ask God for forgiveness and prepare your heart again as we come to the Lord's table. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, I know that we were not able to do justice to the text this morning. Father, I know that we will have opportunity in the days ahead to be able to spend a little time digging into what these false teachers really look like. Father, we know they're all over our world today. Leading people astray from the truth of your word. So this morning, if that defines some of us, maybe we would be convicted of your Holy Spirit. We would confess that what we're doing is not consistent with what your word says. And then maybe there's some of us that just need to prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's table to, to receive it in a worthy manner as the scriptures call us to. Father, wherever we are, may we be responsive to you as you speak to our hearts and minds. So, your head's bowed and your eyes closed. Let's stand to our feet. Nice Brother Benny to come. Give us a song of invitation. The invitation is for all of us as believers to prepare our hearts and minds. Not just for this moment in communion, which is a special moment for us, but to prepare our hearts and minds to leave from this place and to be different, to make a difference in the world in which we function. Father, in this moment, help us to be obedient. Our prayer is always, Thy will be done. For we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Brother Benny, what number we sing this morning? 455. In 455, as we sing together this morning, you respond to the Spirit of God as it speaks to your heart and mind. Father, as we come today, may you speak to us, give us an opportunity to prepare our hearts and minds to receive what Jesus has done for us. Father, we love you. Thank you that you're speaking to us. We ask that you continue through this time of worship again. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Yes. Congregation, if you'd be seated for just a moment. Just a second, the choir is going to sing for us. I would encourage us as a congregation to just prepare our hearts and minds as we come to the Lord's table to receive the communion to
my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God.
body of Christ, broken for you. Blessings over the cup. Dear Lord, we're in awe of the grace and mercy that you show us every day. We're humble <coughs> by the fact that you spill your blood to cover the multitude of sin that we commit today. Thank you for the praise we can lift you up. Not for the Lord, but to us, but for the Lord to you. Thank you.
Let's stand together. Blood of Christ, shed for the remission of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of remembering what Jesus did for us. May we go in his strength from this place today, sharing his love with all that we come in contact with. And even as we gather together this evening, show that love through giving out candy and playing games, sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ through it all. May you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> take an opportunity. As we learn from the scripture, they went out and sang a hymn. We haven't had the opportunity. Let's shake hands this morning and hug next, and then we'll sing our dismissal hymn, our chorus this morning as we close. Good morning. Good morning.